think I got the dull and boring job this morning of looking in detail at these uh, new procedures. First, I think I should uh, uh, say that I was heavily involved in the Maastricht Treaty uh, when I was in the Department of Finance, so I bear some responsibility for where we are now. I'm not going to say that uh, it was a bad thing and uh, that we shouldn't have done it, because I certainly think it is, it is a good thing. And particularly when, when I was in Luxembourg at the time that the coins and notes came into operation, I was able to get rid of the, uh, the folder I had with uh, German Deutschmarks, with Belgian francs, with French francs and Irish pounds, because in Luxembourg you're so close to the border you'd be crossing over rather regularly to all of these countries. So even from that point of view it was absolutely wonderful. But I know at the time that we were setting it up everybody uh, was aware that the economic side of it was much less developed. Uh, there were things put in there in the Stability and Growth Pact uh, and, and uh, the budgetary conditions set out in the Maastricht Treaty itself. It was expected that that would evolve over time, but at that particular time there certainly wasn't an appetite to go much further than uh, what was put in that treaty. But of course, as we know, uh, not even what was put in place was implemented properly, uh, not to mind moving on. And I think we can all remember back in 2001, I think it was, when uh, the, we were the first country to be given recommendations uh, to, to change our policy because we were breaching the broad guidelines of economic policy, having an expansionary budget or two expansionary a budget. And we got that great uh, economic philosopher who uh, said, uh, when we have money, we spend it. Uh, which was the reaction. Uh, in retrospect, it was quite clear that we were expanding too fast at that time and should have been uh, taking action. So we have, in, after the crisis, we've moved on to uh, look at what, what more needed to be done, what more broad sort of issues do we need to look at beyond just the budgetary, the direct budgetary one, and what greater co level of coordination do we need in economic policy? And that has led on to uh, the new procedures and processes that have been put into place. And I think the question, the question that we need to ask today is uh, not, is it going far enough, but are there too many procedures in place now? Is it far too complex? And is it really, are we really thrashing around rather than uh, looking uh, specifically at the, the, the real issues? Michael McGrath mentioned the European semester, which is a strengthened yearly uh, cycle of economic policy coordination. We've kept what was there in the Maastricht Treaty and the Stability and Growth Pact, but added on the Treaty on Stability, Growth and uh, Convergence in the EMU, added on the <coughs> directives and regulations in the Six Pack and the Two Pack, and then added on on top of them as well the uh, the EU 2020 strategy, uh, which has five key targets uh, for the member states and individual targets for, specified for the member states, and then also seven flagship projects in the EU, which seems a rather a lot to me. And then we have the Euro Plus Pact added on, where the, e, where the Euro member countries make specific commitments each year to go beyond what, uh, what, what they are otherwise committed to do. And we have the reverse qualified majority brought in, which is designed to make it easier for Commission proposals to get through. And that says that instead of needing a, a, major, a qualified majority to uh, accept commission proposals, you need a qualified majority to reject them, so, which is a, a much more difficult thing to do. Now, the surveillance starts with the annual growth survey, uh, which comes out, comes out around October, September, October every year. And it looks at the overall growth in the community, where we are going, and what are the problems. And for the last 
three years in a row, they've actually listed the same five objectives that we should be pursuing. Uh, and then the member states submit their stability and uh, st stability uh, programs or their con convergence programs, the stability programs for the EU member, the Euro members, and convergence programs for the others, and their national reform programs. Uh, and in them, they include the response to the Euro, the EU 2020 strategy, and the Euro Plus commitments. And they then lead to the adoption of the, the broad economic policy guidelines and the country-specific recommendations uh, that uh, member states are asked to follow. And I suppose one good thing, those country-specific recommendations have been there for some time, but now uh, member states are asked to uh, report on how they have implemented them. So instead of just having them there and then they get ignored, you now have to at least uh, show that you've done your homework and have uh, done something about them and uh, are taking them seriously. Now, in the budgets, we're supposed to take those recommendations into account uh, and uh, see about ful fulfilling them. Now, in the, in the growth survey, the overall fiscal stance of the union is looked at, uh, but uh, I think people in this country would be wondering why the countries that have room for manoeuvre aren't asked to use that room for manoeuvre a lot more than they are uh, to help the, the ones who need to take uh, austerity measures. But all that the Commission has been doing in recent years is running the, the policy of differentiated, growth-friendly fiscal consolidation, which in layman's terms means that take action to try and promote growth, but, uh, for example, promote capital expenditure and reduce your current expenditure, or change your tax system uh, in a way that promotes growth, but uh, while keeping the revenue unchanged, that sort of thing. And I think part, part of the reason for that is that the overall budget position uh, is now very constrained, that our commitments on the overall budget uh, through the Treaty on Stability and uh, Coordination now requires us to get down to a deficit of no more than a half, a structural deficit of no more than a half percent for most countries. You can get to 1% if, uh, if your debt level is below the 60% mark. Now, the structural deficit, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the absolute uh, deficit, does leave some room for maneuver uh, when you're in a, uh, a cyclically bad situation. Um, but I think there is difficulty in defining what the structural budget deficit is which uh, this is what the structural position is, or what the cyclical position is, which makes it difficult to actually implement this. Uh, but hopefully over time, and I think there, there are efforts within the union to uh, get more consensus on how it should be measured, particularly for a small country like Ireland. Then the debt to GDP ratio has to be moving towards the 60%. Uh, and reducing by one twentieth of the excess every year. Michael mentioned, Dr. Graham mentioned the medium term objective that we all have to, have to set out as well. But that medium term objective is simply that we're all to reach the minus a half percent or minus one percent or do better than it. Uh, you can't have a medium term objective that says, well, we're going to stay at a 2% deficit or, uh, or anything like that at all. And until the medium term objective has been, has been reached, there's a specific provision that says your, your expenditure, uh, your annual expenditure growth must be below the uh, medium term rate of potential GDP growth unless it's matched by discretionary revenue increases. So that's a, a barrier or a, a curve on uh, increasing your expenditure. 
And if there's a significant deviation from your move towards the medium term objective, there has to be an automatic <coughs> measure uh, there. And we have put uh, provision in our legislation that says if the Commission find that we're not moving towards our medium term objective uh, properly, uh, that the government will bring proposals uh, to Parliament within, I think, it's six weeks of getting that recommendation. So, as I say, it's pretty well constrained on the budget position. Now, medium-term plans for at least three years have to be published, budgetary plans, by, uh, published in April in the stability programme. And as we heard, the draft annual budget is to be submitted by the 15th of October, adopted by the 31st of December. And both of these, both the three-year program, three-year plan and budget, must be based on a independently prepared or endorsed macroeconomic uh, forecasts. Uh, the original version of uh, these proposals said it had to be based on <coughs> independently prepared macroeconomic forecasts. And it was only at a late stage that that changed into prepared or endorsed. And I could see the hand of the, the, the Irish uh, officials in, in, in that sort of change. Uh, although I'm sure others may have wanted it too. Uh, now, when budgets are presented, the Commission can't just change the budget. Uh, they can't go that far. But they can give their opinion. And if there is a serious non-compliance with the commitments uh, under uh, whatever commitments in stability plans, stability commitments to get towards, heading towards the medium term objective, the Commission can request a revised budget to be prepared, but that would only be where there is serious non-compliance. Now, we've gone through the first year of this uh, budget, draft budget being submitted, and it is, it is only the Euro countries that have to do this, that the Commission, uh, having reviewed the budgets submitted in mid-October, happily found that none were in serious non-compliance, so they didn't have to take out the, the heavy hammer. Uh, but they did divide the countries into, into groups, and they found that five were compliant with their stability, uh, the stability growth pact provisions, only two of them fully compliant, uh, which happened to be Germany and uh, Estonia. Uh, indeed, they found that Germany was exceeding its medium-term objective, uh, so going further than they, they, they needed to go. Three had no margin for, uh, for slippage, so they were okay, but no margin for slippage. They were France, the Netherlands, and uh, Slovenia. They found three broadly compliant, but um, may deviate from their medium-term objective. So they're saying, you're, you're just about okay, but you better keep an eye on developments. They were Belgium, Austria, Austria and Slovakia. And they found five posing a risk of non-compliance, and that they should do something to ensure compliance, effectively saying, we don't really believe that you're going to achieve your objectives on the basis of what you have put forward there. They were Spain, Italy, Luxembourg, Malta, and Finland. Now, Ireland and the other countries in our microeconomic <coughs> program were not subject to the process this year, um, which may uh, explain why our budget wasn't marked down as being a draft budget when it was presented. Uh, Next year, when, uh, now that we're out of the program, we will have to go through this process. The Commission will look at our budget. We did present it to them in advance this year and got their, uh, we consulted them anyway and they said that's okay. So I suppose we did go through the process, but the Commission uh, report on, uh, on, on, on assessing the draft budgets does not cover the Irish budget or any of the others in a macroeconomic <coughs> program. Now, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, the excessive deficit procedure are still there. We still have the overall Maastricht Treaty uh, targets of the ceiling of 3% nominal deficit. 
Um, I'm not sure that uh, in future, if we do get down to our medium-term objectives, I don't think this 3% will be very relevant anymore, uh, but I suppose when it's in the treaty, it's difficult to, <laughs> to change it. Um, uh, the prevented, the, the excessive deficit procedure is still being fully implemented and has been strengthened under the, the, uh, the new uh, regulations and directives. And particularly, I think, strengthens the, what's called the correct, the, the preventative arm of it, that uh, trying to t make sure people take action well in advance of uh, getting into an excessive deficit. That they, they, there is provision there now uh, for making recommendations if a country is heading towards an excessive uh, deficit and indeed looking for a, uh, an interest-bearing deposit uh, if, if, if the country doesn't, doesn't take account of the recommendations from the Commission. And yes, a new, another, a new requirement in the excessive deficit procedure is that an economic partnership <coughs> program has to be prepared by any country going into a, an excessive deficit procedure or having a change in the conditions or in the requirements under the excessive deficit procedure. And that sets out the policy measures and structural reforms to be taken to correct the excessive deficit. Now, happily, that is only the, to be prepared once. You don't have to do it on an annual basis and it's to be incorporated into the, uh, st the, the stability program or the convergence program. Mm -hmm. But it is yet another, uh, yet another new process that uh, has been added on. Now the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, uh, I suppose is the big one that uh, we, we'll have to put our faith in. And it is trying to look wider than the budget deficit and look at all the other economic uh, issues that are there to try and uh, prevent uh, the emergence of great uh, harmful imbalances and correct any that are already there. And under this, the Commission each year prepares an, a, a, an alert mechanism report, um, which uh, is based on 11 indicators that have been selected, uh, and we'll just look at them in the next, next slide. And using these indica indicators, the Commission identifies uh, where in, what countries need an in-depth review to be carried out to see do they have a, a real uh, problem. And this year, 16 countries uh, have been identified as needing an in-depth review. Uh, there were 13 last year. Uh, this year, Germany, Luxembourg, and Croatia have been added to the list. Uh, in Germany's case, it was because the current account deficit, sorry, current account surplus was exceeding 6% on average for the last three years, and that is the ceiling on uh, that particular indicator. And of course, we did have some negative reactions in the German press and uh, etc. to Germany being singled out for an in-depth review. But of course, the in-depth review doesn't mean that action is going to be taken. It only leads to the, the review taking place. And at the end of the review, the Commission then decides, is there a problem? Do we need to take action? Uh, there is provision for sanctions, for recommendations to be made, for sanctions to be applied if people don't do something about their, uh, their imbalances. So far, uh, nobody has been put into a, the imbalance, the excessive imbalance procedure. All the Commission have done is make recommendations for people to uh, take some action. Now, the, the MIP doesn't apply to Ireland yet are to the other countries in the uh, adjustment programs. But, uh, our statistics are covered in the alert mechanism report, uh, but they say in relation to Ireland that they will look at Ireland uh, uh, when we have exited the program. So we can expect them. I'm not sure whether they'll do something early this year or wait until next year, but uh, we're not covered by that procedure just at the moment. Now, the, the indicators are <laughs> external imbalance and competitiveness uh, on the one hand and internal imbalances on the other, covering current account situation, the net international investment position, 
employment, etc. So there are a range that uh, have been identified by the member states and the Commission as being the, 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 the relevant ones that we need to keep an eye on. And I suppose if, if we had been looking at them as closely as we will uh, now, if we had been looking at them in the past, we might have been identifying the, uh, the problems that are coming up rather faster than we did. But it does depend on uh, people accepting that uh, the, 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 that the Commission uh, proposals in their case are relevant and that they're willing to do something and not just say, ah, well, I mean, we're going to have a soft landing, so why, 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 why worry? Now, the strength and surveillance for Euro member states in, in uh, programs or receiving financial assistance, I think Michael already mentioned that uh, we will be kept under stronger surveillance until we have repaid 75% of the financial assistance. Uh, as far as I can see, that will only mean we might have visits more often from the Commission and indeed the IMF for a while, but uh, is not going to require us to do uh, too much more than that. Now, there are some more proposals on the table that are being considered, such as uh, proposals for mutually agreed contractual arrangements, which was discussed at the last uh, European Council meeting, and that they come back with more proposals later in the year. This is an idea that uh, where we need big reforms, that uh, a country may agree to carry out those reforms, uh, but get some assistance from the other member states or from, from the Union uh, to help them to implement these reforms. It's not clear who's going to pay for it or whether it's going to be loans, whether it's going to be uh, grants or what it's going to be. Uh, I, I find it difficult to see it really taking off uh, and the discussion at the last European Council meeting didn't get too far other than saying we'll come back to it, review it further and come back to it. There are other things like that that are on the table which may add to the, the list of things where there's a requirement that we have uh, dis ex ante discussions of, of major economic reforms in each country that they should be discussed at European level before we implement them. How that's going to happen is also being uh, looked at at the moment. But just to conclude, the, I mean, the processes have been revamped, have been extended, uh, and as was from our point of view, it's good that these apply to all countries, both small and big. Uh, so Germany and France and others are uh, just as subject to it as we are. Uh, whether they will accept it, uh, whether they'll implement things when they're told to or not is another matter. Uh, Certainly last year when France was told to do something about its pensions in the country-specific recommendations, the president said, oh, we will not be dictated to by Brussels. We will do what we want when we want. And, uh, but in practice, they were already implementing some reforms or developing reforms anyway, but didn't want to be seen to be doing it at the behest of Brussels. So as I said at the start, a lot has developed. There are great new procedures there, uh, but there may be too many at this stage, or certainly too many targets to be met uh, at the one time. I don't think any country can uh, be implementing all the country-specific recommendations and the targets on the, uh, the 2020 strategy and the Euro Plus Pact. Uh, the, we need a smaller number of targets, I would have thought, rather than a larger number. Okay? Thank you very much.